about quantum computers and mathematics and some problems that you just can't solve. But how does it really work and affect your lives? Today, Dr. Dr. Pontaza <laughs> and I, we both are going to make the science behind it edible for everybody. Así que, toma pulque y come nopal, que el pulque podcast va a comenzar. It's my pleasure to welcome to this space, Dr. Dr. Pontaza. You don't have to say that, but it's okay. Dr. Dr. Pontaza, <laughs> good you. afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, Dr. Pontaza, how would you describe yourself? Oh, <laughs> well, um, I will say that actually, um, right now, just basically working on the research, right? Like, it's just like a, a normal PhD student. Uh, right now, I'm working on two PhDs, one in computer science and the other one in electrical engineering, right? Um, have some background in math, right? And uh, basically, have been living in Taiwan for around like, what, 10 years already? So, yeah, I mean, like, uh, a person actually, like, uh, likes to study and basically, like, do research, right? Right now, I'm working in research in uh, Yaoda, which right now merged with another school. is like Yamin Yaotong Dashue, right? And um, also with TSMC, right? Working on a semiconductor that is uh, aiming to perform some post-quantum cryptography, right? And basically, that's what I have been, like, doing right now, like, mostly, right? So. Okay, going back a little bit uh where do you come from okay uh and what did you study for bachelor's um what are your master degrees and um yeah yeah mainly that. okay uh well i'm from guatemala right uh i study well just like normal uh, elementary school high school uh i had a situation when i was growing up which was that uh, uh I, per I i was basically selected back home to perform in the international math and medical olympiads right i participated in the central american uh, like a american and also the international one the imo and um and basically like um uh, yeah i i started studying like a university degree math when I was 14, right? Uh, taking, instead of taking, for example, like the traditional, like algebra or like a, like a geometrical, like I would say like the normal geometry from from high school, I was studying already analysis and uh, okay. like, like uh, well, it's not even calculus. It's like the fundamentals of analysis, right? Uh, like inequalities, like basically like segmentations of math, right? Uh, for my undergrad, uh, I study, well, like computer science and also like uh, math, like pure math. Okay. Right. And I uh, here for the master, I came to Taiwan to study like originally a master in computer science. Then um, I had a situation that actually uh, like from the master, I like extended to the PhD, <laughs> right? In computer science and also like study my master in math, but, like all of them here in NTU, right? And then I started studying my PhD in, co in electrical engineering in, in Jauda, in NCTU, right? And right now, what do you... How do you feel by studying two PhDs at the same time? Uh, what are like the challenges that you have encountered? I mean, you just said that you've been in Taiwan for, for more ten than years. ten years. Yeah, ten years. So I, yes. I, I, I studied when I was a kid. Yeah, so, for sure. So yeah, I mean, like I studied like as Taiwanese with Bopo Mofo, right? Yeah. And um, like so you studied Zuin. Yeah, Zuin. Yeah, oh, and also like a. Uh, Instead of like, for example, here in Taiwan, like for foreigners, normally they teach like the grammatical structure, like you have to memorize it, right? And, like when you study, like as a Taiwanese, you study by by uh, stories, right? You have to memorize the story, and then, like when you're a kid, you infer the logic, right? And they, like you infer the stru the grammatical structures. They don't teach you like, oh, this is the structure, and then you have to follow these rules. No, like after reading, it's like, oh, that's how you say it, right? So I would not say that my, my Chinese is perfect. No, definitely no. <laughs> but I mean, like um. Uh, yes, I like study when I was a kid, right? And uh, like one of the challenges for the PhD, basically, like I will say, the the, the hardest one are the papers, right? Because it's like uh, there are deadlines for that. You have to work a lot on that. Um, good thing about studying on two degrees at the same time is that actually you can apply something from one of those into the other one, right? Okay. So, for example, in computer science, everything is more theoretical, right? It's like theory. Electrical engineering is more applied, right? So, but if you have like some of the knowledge from from programming and also knowledge from the math 
like fundamentals that actually say why the programs and why the algorithms are supposed to be like that, then you can express that in like semiconductors, right? So basically that's like one of the aims of the research in Java at the moment. And for computer science, I know that you are working in, in very important uh, or working on very important problems. Yeah. Can you, you tell us about those? Well, yes. Um, Computers in my, my degree in computer science, basically, it's, um, it's called uh, computing theory, right? Computing theory is basically the fundamentals of why computer science is like that, right? Um, right now, you guys are hearing about like AI, and basically, people are saying, oh, I can train a neural network that actually can solve, like, for example, can find, I don't know, like a like a, given a set of pictures to determine which ones are like trees, which ones are cars, right? Those are like, uh, the, this is this is actually the, the nowadays AI. Previous AI, like probably like five, six years ago, it was different. It was like searching in trees, right? But those problems are really like bounded in just the nature of the problem itself. It's like, I give you a set of pictures and I, and I ask which are cars, which are trees, like yeah, to select yeah. them, right? To Basically it's to separate one from the other ones, it's to select, right? But now if I ask a computer, okay, can you prove that for any prime greater than three, a P, a P prime minus number. prime number P? Okay. Yeah, greater than three, P minus one divided by two is always integer, right? And AI cannot do that, right? So there's another set of computational problems or like a computing theory that uh, tries to tries to basically solve that problem, like these kind of problems to teach that. That's my research in Taida, right? In NTU. Right. But from the same theory, you learn some stuff that actually we're going to cover well today. Right. And that's <laughs> and that's basically the fundamentals of the cryptography that actually we are aiming to achieve in, in Yauda, right, in NCTU. Right. So basically, like uh, today, like what we were saying is that uh, I, I basically would like to cover uh, one of the main important problems in computer science which is uh, P versus NP, right? What does NP mean and what does P mean? I will say that before going to that point, I prefer okay, to okay. talk about like what what is this problem and like the background of it before getting into the, the details. Okay, please. Right. Basically, like um, in computer science, there are basically a lot of problems that we don't know, but one of the fundamental ones, if not the most important one, is this question, P versus NP. This problem, uh, along with other six problems, were considered one like the seven most important problems from humankind at the moment, right? So, which are called the millennium problems, right? Oh, one was already solved. Exactly. Right? Yes. Like uh, I think it was like probably a couple of years ago, right? By a Russian. Guy. Yeah, a Russian guy. That's that's another story because this Russian guy he said that there was like some sort of like corruption in the like in the price process. Well, but anyway, the thing that it was really important that actually was solved. And these problems are important because um, if you solve the problem, then uh, you can, uh, that solution can lead the human knowledge. But like, I mean, in a different way, in a, in a huge, I will say like, it will have a huge impact, right? Uh, these problems, I will say that actually, um, they are difficult, not because they are only difficult, and mostly, and this is one of the topics that we're going to cover today, most likely we don't have the knowledge to solve them yet. And yeah. uh, based on history, like uh, like I will give you an example, that's the reason why I have some stuff here. Based on that, they might we might even happen to, we will have, we will have to wait probably a couple hundred years, if not a 1,000 years, to reach to the knowledge to be able to solve those problems, right? Yeah. The thing is that if we are, for example, for P versus MP, right, if we can solve that problem, it has huge implications. I mean, like if, if we determine, like if it is, if it is, if they're the same or they're different, uh, the implications are that, first of all, like if they're the same, we can cure cancer, right? And we can cure cancer with a Sudoku solution, right? So okay. if you are able to solve Sudoku, then you can cure cancer. But how come? We are going to show you like an example, right? And not exactly that one, but I mean like okay. an idea of that, right? Another one of the of the of the consequences of that is that um, like AI can simulate a human mind, right? And AI might not be bounded. I mean, like AI has like I would say a extremely high potential, but not AI as the AI right now, but the AI, like the true AI, like the one that is like conscious, right? Like it okay. might reach we might reach that point. If P and DP and P are different, then AI, like the AI based on the actual on the, on the nowadays computers is fundamentally limited. So there will be a point that actually we cannot do anything more, right? And we will have to move to a different type of machine in order to reach more, like I would say, advanced results, right? So 
this problem is very important because it's like a, not only can teach us like okay the limits of our computation and the limits of the of the universe but also like can help us help us to uh reach a solution for fundamental problems that we don't know how to solve right now right so basically like uh okay the p versus mp so what does that mean right the thing is that uh back in the 60s when the computers start like being used in the universities right um they were like the super computers back in the day that actually like required like a huge room like just to calculate i don't yeah, know like yeah. 500 gigas of like had 500 gigas of space like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, i mean like it was, it was like the super huge computers right the thing is that um back in that time the engineers that were saying okay so like right now we have this this problem like these computers right which problems can we solve with that with them right so like they say okay so for example if i have a array of numbers and i want to sort them right can when can i do it yes perfect i can do it in a reasonable reasonable amount of time right now for example if i have a, a if i have i don't know like a set of numbers right and i give you like a one possible number and i say like is there any subset of those of those numbers that added can give me that result? That problem is really difficult, and they couldn't solve it. I mean, like in a reasonable amount of time. So they were saying, okay, so there might be some problems that they are fundamentally easy, and there are some of them that are fundamentally hard. So how can we classify them, right? Okay. So they say, like, okay, we have. Let's a say which one is an easy one. Yes. I will say like an easy, but it's we're going to define what easy and hard means oh, for okay. computers, yeah, right. right? So the thing is that they try, they had like these problems, and they say like, okay, we want to classify them, right? But uh, they they didn't know how to do it, right? So they started like coming up with probably like some characteristics of each problems, and they realized something that sometimes the solution of one problem can lead to solutions of other problems, right? But they realize also like, oh, the solution for this problem can never reach the solution of this other problem, right? Yeah. So they were like fundamentally areas. So like, I would say uh, sets of problems that actually some of them, they were equivalent, equivalent and some of them, they were not, right? So there comes like the P versus MP situation. P is the set of problems that are can be easy computable, right? That a solution can be found easily. For example, if I give you, I don't know, like two and three, and I ask you what is the addition of that, two and three is just five. Five. Right? Now, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy problem, right? The, yeah. the thing is that, uh, uh, well, uh, that's, the, that's the, the P set, like the problems that are easy to solve. Yeah. NP means that actually is the set of problems that are easy to verify, right? So, for example, if I give you two, three, and five, and I ask you, is, like, is five addition of two and three? Yes or no? Yes, yes, right? Yes. It's easy to verify, verify, right? Because you can recalculate that. Yeah. Now there are some problems. Like, for example, let's suppose that I tell you, okay, this there, I have a, a game of chess and I have already some configuration and I tell you, oh, this movement is the best one I can do. How will you verify that? It's really difficult, right? Yeah, you need to start running on like a... It's a type of program in order to really like you have to do a lot of simulations exactly so so it's really difficult to for example in that one to verify if then if the movement that i'm giving you is the best one or not right so there are some problems that are fundamentally easy to verify and some of them are fundamentally hard right so Just going back a little bit to the p and mp mm -hmm. p means uh polynomial time yeah and np means it basically, okay, so basically P means like polynomial is, okay, P and MP, uh, it's, uh, I would say like P is the comp is a set of, com of problems that can be easy, f uh, solvable by a deterministic computer. That's okay. basically the important part. What is a de deterministic computer? Deterministic computer is the computers that we have right now. Okay. Like, like a comp a deter uh, something is deterministic if... You give the it's a process, right? So a process is deterministic. If you give the same input, it will give you the same output in almost the same amount of time, right? Okay. So it's kind of a computer. It's like you can repeat the same thing over and over again, and there's there no weird magic thing happening, right? It's very you know everything about that system, right? Yeah. An input could be just to push a letter, and then the output will be that you see it in screen. Exactly. Right? Okay. The thing is that now with MP, NP is is non-deterministic. It like it means that actually the like the, with the computers that we're using here are non-deterministic. Uh, that means that uh, there's something in the middle that uh, it has like some sort of randomness, yeah. right? 
So sometimes it could take a little bit of time, sometimes it could take a little bit more, or the path, the logical path that we like the computer follows to reach to the solution might not be the same all the time, right? So quantum computers, basically they are like an example of that. Basically they say like, okay, so they, there are some qubits and basically we have like some- We go in yeah, yeah, yeah. My, 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 <laughs> <laughs> my point is that actually like, um, like um, there is like a, this kind of situation, right? That uh, like there, there's some randomness in, in, inside, right? So the problem is that uh, we don't know if every problem that is, that can be easily solvable, like can, you can solve it easily, is also easy to, like, I'm sorry. We know that every problem that is also like, easy to solve is easy to verify. Yeah. So we don't know if a problem that is easy to verify is also easy to solve, right? Okay. We don't know that, right? I mean, like like all of them, like if there is equivalence. So that's a problem between P and NP, right? So why do you think it, this might be like the situation? Basically, like there are problems that in one sense, they look hard, but you can transform them into other problems, right? That are easy. That are easy, right? So that's what basically why I got like some stuff here, okay, right? Please. So, yeah. So I think actually like that way it will be okay, right? Okay. So you can have this one. For the people who are only listening, Dr. Pontaza just took a <laughs> whiteboard. Yes, there's a whiteboard. And actually, we're he, going to play a, a small... He arrived with some No, 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 but that's, that's later. That's later. <laughs> yes. So basically... Shoelace. <laughs> I, I don't know what else. Right. So basically... So if you want to um, actually see what you are uh, going to draw, you got to go to our YouTube channel. I, I can describe it also, so there's okay. no problem. Okay, so the thing is that actually we're going to play a small game, right? And then I will show you what does the transformation mean from one set to the other one, right? Okay. So for example, let's suppose that actually we have, like, I was saying like this, like a, like an array of numbers. Four, five, six, okay. Seven, eight, oh my God, and nine, right? Okay, so there will be two players, A and B, Okay. right? So you can have this one, which is the red one. Okay, so basically like we're going to play a game, right? So it's like, we're going to pick numbers, right? The thing is that if I pick, for example, three, you cannot pick it, like, it's like each one picks one number, right? Okay. And we can p keep uh, picking numbers and the aim is that actually we need, to, uh, we need to reach, the addition of those three needs to reach 15. Okay. Right? So exactly, 15, right? So for example, if I pick three, right? Which number do you want to pick? Pick nine. Literally, you can just pick, okay, nine, right? So, for example, if I pick, I don't know, like six, it's already nine, right? 15, it will be like, yeah. oh my god, I lost already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my point is like, okay, you can pick, a, you can pick another one, right? I would pick four. And then, yeah, well, in that case, for you to avoid you to win, I can pick one. Why? Nine and. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, nine and four. No, 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 it's two, it's two, it's two, right? I can pick up. <laughs> no, no, okay. Oh, so you can make me I can pick two, right? Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. But you see, it's not that, a, it's not a trivial game, right? Yeah, yeah. But then, so I can ask you, like, is there any way or any optimal way to play this game, right? For example, if I am a human, if you're a machine, can you play this game optimally, right? So there's, well, we can do something, right? Instead of having this array like this, like from one to nine, we can like we can create like a grid, right? We can create a grid, right? So with the numbers set up like this, nine five one. Oh, sorry. I think actually you cannot see it like okay, sure, 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 right, like this, and then uh, four three eight. Okay, so oh sorry. So basically, it will be like. Two seven six nine five one four three eight, right? Like a like a three by three grid, right? There's a there's a, a important characteristic about this grid, which is like this is like the addition of all like rows, columns, right, and diagonals. I'll give you fifteen. Fifteen. What is the name of this one? It's a magic square. Okay. It's a magic square, right? So yeah, then, even like this. Yes, the uh, diagonals also make like fifteen, right? They add up to fifteen, right? So playing this game now becomes this game, right? Yeah. So what you what you have to do is like, for example, if I pick two, then for example, like this one, I will pick it like this here. Like you can pick another one, right? No, but like with the, with the X, you can play with the X. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So like, for example, like this one. Okay, I have to do it like this, right? Yeah, yeah. But then this game becomes what? Yeah, what? It becomes Gato. a tic-tac-toe, <laughs> tic right? 
Tic-tac-toe. Okay, tic-tac-toe. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So basically, it, this is basically the same game. So this problem was transformed into a magic square, and the magic square transformed into tic-tac-toe, right? And tic-tac-toe, you have been playing it since you were a kid, right? Yeah, that's right. The thing is that this problem seem or this game seem a little bit abstract, right? Yeah. This one is simple, right? So if you know a winning strategy, if you know an optimal solution for this problem, then you can solve this problem, right? Sorry. I'm just gonna switch it. Okay, so you know what I mean, right? So you have this problem, like you, you, you are able to solve this problem, which is easy, right? Then, and this problem was hard. So what you have to do is like, if you have a machine, yeah, like it can solve it, like you have this problem, and if I give you some inputs, then you give it to the machine that solves this one, the, the machine plays the game and then goes back to the arena game, right? That's the concept of transformation. This problem was hard. Well, it seemed to be hard. This problem it seems to be easy, yeah. right? So that's the idea. Like the idea is that actually, we don't know if all the problems can be transformed into this kind of way, right? We know some fundamental problems that are easy to solve. We know some fundamental, uh, fundamental problems that are hard to solve. We don't know if, we don't if know. What? Huh? We don't know if yeah, what? We don't know if actually like, uh, uh, if actually the easy to solve problems, that if the hard to solve problems can be solved uh, easily by a clever way to transform them. Yeah, right? yeah. So that's basically like what this kind of problem is, right? Uh, the thing is that actually like um, easy to solve and easy to verify problems are like the best, uh, this is like really oversimplifying the thing, right? Is the best way to understand like the nature of the problems. There are other problems, right? Um, basically, like what happens is this, like uh, I, I can just draw it again, right? Yeah, sure. So the problems that are easy to solve are here, right? The P ones. The P ones, yes. So every problem that is easy to solve can be easy verified, right? Because yes. you just like recalculate the solution again and that's it, right? The problem is that we don't know if these ones are the same or not. We don't know that, right? But those, I mean, I am saying like this one is solvable in a reasonable amount of time, like easy. Yeah. This one is verified and easy in a reasonable amount of time, which is supposed to be easy, right? Then comes more fundamental problems, right? That are like, they require exponential time or exponential space, right? One of them is like exp time, right? Which requires exponential time to solve. Right, but the space is still like bounded. It's not like growing exponentially big. Okay, right? okay. You mean so, so for example, exponential time. yeah, growing exponentially time. For example, like chess, right? Like as I told you, like uh, like the best movement, right? Yeah. You like you don't have infinite size chess, right? It's just like a like eight by eight, right? Yeah. So the space you don't require a lot of it, but you require more time, right? But there are now like other fundamental problems here. X space, right? So. The thing is that actually exponential space require like more space to, to solve them, right? From those problems on, they come either, either like even more, like I would say abstract problems and paradoxes become like they appear here. <laughs> like uh, when the problems that actually like, because after, after this one, it comes like this one, R, and it comes a bigger one, which is R, E, right? R are basically the problems that can be decided. Right. Okay. And the RE are the problems that can be just basically mentioned, but you don't. So the these problems are the easiest. The, yes. There are only a few. Yeah, I want to say there are a few. There are a lot of them, but the thing is that actually they are easy to solve. And a computer nowadays, like on the, the normal laptops, yeah, you can yeah. go, and a computer can solve these kind of problems. These problems, for example, if I tell you like like a, an addition, right? Okay, uh, uh, if I ask you the addition of a couple of numbers, your laptop, my laptop, like any, uh, even a, a, a cell phone can solve that problem. But now if I ask you like, okay, this is the input of all the, of all the streets of Taipei, right? And I want uh, you to um, basically uh, tell me like, oh, make a grid of like uh, the, the street lights, right? I get to control them for a couple, for an entirely amount of hours, right? A cell phone cannot do it. Right. Yeah. So then, like, it comes like it, it requires more, either more time or more space. Like, the thing is that actually the problems can be classified in this kind of situation, right? So, the, the, some computers or some like algorithms that actually can solve problems that are equivalent in, in some sort of sense around here, right? So the thing is that actually fundamentally we don't know if these problems are the same or not, right? So the consequences of that one is that uh, we know some problems. Like, can you have the other one? For sure. Okay, please. So we know some problems here. 
that we already know the solution for those. And we know some problems around here that if we can solve them optimally, then we can cure like cancer. We can- As you said. Yeah, like we can, there are some problems around here that actually, if we know the optimal solution, we can find, I mean like we can find a lot of important things, right? But how do you find them? How can you link a, it's kind of a like, problem to a, let's say medical way to, for example, like with cancer, cura. for example, with cancer, right? Yeah. The thing is that there are some processes that we don't know inside the cell, right? Yeah. The thing is that those processes happen really quickly, right? Yes. So, so if that happens, that means that actually it, could, it should be like, uh, it should be, uh, you can make a model of it, right? Yeah. That, and uh, like a model that is running on- You can on, simulate it. You simulate it, right? The thing is that the simulations right now, they take a lot of time because there are a lot of variables inside and they are really oh, complex. Of course. But the thing is that if these two are the same, then that means that actually there exists an optimal algorithm to simulate that. Of course. Yeah? Okay, so okay. basically like there, there will be a link between an easy solution here and basically that problem and we can just link them like this, right? So. So that way we can basically link some of the problems. We, so we have some problems here, we have some problems and their solutions here. So then we can just jump from one to the other one. Right? Yeah. So that will be like if P and NP are the same, but if, and also like another consequence of this one is that actually like the AI, as I told you, like it will be like, it will have a really great potential, right? Right now, as humans, we can solve some problems in MP, right? The thing is that uh, we don't know if like like a like a like simulated mind will be able to reach the same level of complexity as ours, right? So let's say humans humans knowledge arise until here. Let's say. <laughs> it's kind of difficult to say like the humans are on to here because we can solve some other problems outside, okay, right? Okay. I mean, like we can solve problems outside, but the thing is like it would be like something like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's something. I mean, like it's just my point is that actually like like. A, a, a simulated mind can have a way more potential than just like something that you can reach with a normal computer, right? Yeah, yeah. That's my point, right? And humans, we know a lot of this, right? But the thing is that we came up with several consequences, right? Um, well, right now we don't know how is the equivalence between some of these ones. I mean, like some of them, we don't know if they are the same or not, yeah, right? Yeah. The thing or is- Or if it grows at that- uh... At that size. Exactly. Yeah. So the thing is like, okay, so I was, I was, as I was saying, right? So but one of the consequences is that actually like, for example, we could cure cancer. Another consequence and that's, that's the, actually the, the one that concerns all of us is cryptography, right? So, okay. So basically, let me just erase this. And I, I, I do it, I do it. <laughs> the thing is that with cryptography is that right now, the, the nowadays cryptography is based on uh, the fundamental problem of uh, factorization, right? Yeah. So for example, um, like let's suppose if I give you like these numbers, right? Three, nine, seven, three, three, right? Times this one, right? Three, nine, seven, four, oh, sorry, seven, four, nine. Okay. How much is this? You can calculate that easily, right? Which is like this one, one, five, seven, <laughs> nine, three, four, zero. I cannot solve okay. it this Yeah, no, but I mean like my point is that actually you okay. can just put it in a, comp in a calculator and you okay, can find the sure. solution, right? Now, so going from here to here is easy, yes. right? Now I give you this number, one, zero, nine, six, uh, seven, five, three, uh, zero, six, seven, right? And I ask you which two numbers generated it. How will you do it? One in this one. Huh? <laughs> no, the number one in this no, one. No, 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 no. You have two numbers that multiply, give you this result. No, I don't, impossible, no. It's, it's kind of hard to you do this. You need to start, um, they're, they're normal. Factory, yep. you start to Normally what you factorize. do is just, just, you try until up to the square root of this number, and then you try the, all the prime numbers, and yeah, see yeah, basically yeah. which one divide and which one not, right? So, but that's called like seeming or like uh, you just go by like a brute force approach, right? There are other smarter approaches, but the thing is that uh, it's really difficult and the solution is this one, right? So I can just write the solution here. Uh, it's this one. Uh, one, zero, that four. are two prime numbers. Exactly. I would. Yeah, I would there are these two prime numbers. It. But my point is that actually it's hard to, well, it's not that easy to determine the solution. So right? let's say it's easy to go from two numbers to one. Yes. But to go from one, from one number to 
to numbers. Two other. Yes. It's very hard. I would say it's it, it takes uh, it takes a while, right? Yeah, yeah. So cryptography is based on this on this principle, right? That you can go from here to here easy, but from here to here, oh, I'm sorry, from here to here is hard, right? My point is, is like kind of the same idea. You can have when you, crypt, you when you encrypt something, right? One of these numbers could be could be used as part of your private key, right? Yeah. And this other number can be part of your public key or like be used as your like it, it, to generate your public key, right? Yeah. So your public key has to be public, so anyone can see your public key, but they they shouldn't be able to calculate back the private key, right? So for example, that's the reason why if I give you this number, it's difficult to reach this thing, yeah. right? I mean, like this is just a very oversimplified example, but that's the idea that. This is my pro my public key, right? And then it's hard to determine the numbers which generated it, yeah. right? Because our, this is my private. So that's the concept of cryptography. The problem with P and M and, and the P and NP is that we already know an MP. Uh, well, I'm mean, sorry. We already know like with non-deterministic computers an easy way to solve this problem, right? We already know that, uh, for example, for quantum computers, this problem basically it's easy to solve. Yeah. Right now, I mean, like for nowadays computers, this one These is easy. Ones. This one is easy, and this one is hard. For quantum computers, this one is easy, and this one is easy. Right. So if that happens, like if we if if quantum computers become a reality and become like widely available, then like the nowadays cryptography becomes useless. Not useless, but I mean, like it becomes in unsecure. Right. Okay. Uh, let's go a little bit more on the quantum computers. They are not pretty pretty available yet. Mm -hmm. But um, Dr. Pontaza, he's working on the cryptography for when these computers are ready. Because mm -hmm. to the, nowadays computers and nowadays codes, they are coded under um, under like uh, such as you just said, right? Mm -hmm. That we have some, let's say, they are under bits. Yes. That is the minimum amount of information right yes. now. Yes. So, as he said, that this the problem that of above was easy and the down was hard. Mm -hmm. That's how uh, nowadays uh, the hackers work. Uh, my, right? like, okay, my thing is that's that why they they cannot. Um, uh, how do you say like it? a hack or hack. like yeah, the, encrypt the, the, uh, encry uh, like un basically generate the private keys right yeah a crypto system is con I mean like you have your private your public key right yeah. and mathematically speaking it should it, it's possible to calculate your your private regardless of the system the thing is that uh, a system is considered safe if it takes years right if you have a private key a uh, public key right now. If I grab it and I try to guess the private, it should take me years to... With nowadays computers. With nowadays computers, right? The thing is that these kind of problems with quantum computers, it should become a matter of hours. Right? Why? Because it's like quantum computers, like... That, that's one of the, of the situations of the P versus MP situation, right? The thing is that quantum computers, they can reduce the amount of calculations not by... They have, not by one third, but like a square root of a, a thing, right? So what happens is this. Imagine that a computer, like for example, for the easy problem, right? And uh, now yeah. this computer, I will say like computer A, right? Yeah. It takes one million operations to, um, to, to basically calculate, to hack your system, right? And you have a program, right? A program that basically runs on A, right? I would just say like this. And it requires like half of it. Half of it is what? 500,000, right? Yeah. Right now, if you have a computer B, well, um, let's suppose that actually you have like a a computer A, a quantum computer B that basically will um, will run the, like uh, the same process, but uh, like um, the, the, the same process instead of this is like one half, right? The quantum computer instead of running it by by a by a factor one half, it will reduce it by a, a factor of a square root. So instead of running running one hundred like this one, it was one million operations. This one yeah. five hundred operations. 500,000, like a square root of a number of operations is just 1,000 operations. So that's a really big difference, right? Yeah, for sure. The thing is that this one, for example, it takes like, I don't know, like 10 years to solve. This one takes five years to solve, but this one, it shouldn't take more than one year, right? Yeah. So that uh, my point is that it's like a, like a quantum computers will basically speed up the, the calculations and will speed up the, 
the the processes that actually they, they are required to hack a system. Right? And right now we are going even closer. Every day we are getting closer to the quantum computers because nowadays our transistors are getting exactly smaller and smaller. Yes. Like right now transistors they are like 14 nanometers. Uh, uh, the standard is still 17, but uh, TS TSMC is working on a 14. I think it's right now 14.5. Okay, right. let's say 17. Yes. The coronavirus is... It's bigger than that. Yeah, it's bigger than that. So yeah. we are saying that we have transistors smaller than the virus that it's making the pandemic right now. What happened is that like there was like a... Okay, uh, there's something that is called Moore's Law. That it means that actually every two years, the computational power of a device basically multiplies by two, right? So And it was because the transistors will become smaller, 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 yeah. right? But now we are reaching a physical limit, yeah, which that is, is that is the the size of the transistor is getting too so small. close yes. to the size of an atom. Kind of like that, yes. So it's the thing is, that even closer, and the, closer the, so. the the quantum properties of the electrons basically render the transistor useless because it jumps. Like the transistor is basically like a switch. It says like on or off. If it is yeah. off, then the electricity doesn't go off, right, right. So basically, like if this is small, like it's small enough, the electrons will basically quantum jump, right. So it, yeah. like, it renders useless. So there's a problem. Our computers cannot become smaller. But if we want to then, if we want to double the computational power, we have to make it bigger, like m add more transistor states. So the CPUs will become bigger. So instead of making like, like a, uh, back in the, back, like a couple of years ago, the phones were big and they become smaller, smaller, smaller. Then what will happen is that they will become bigger again. Yeah. If we don't move from technology. Like we need to move to the quantum world. Exactly. That like as you said right now, right now transistors, they are on, off. Yes. Could be the light, could be whatever. But once we go to quantum, it can be on and off at the same time. And also it can be negative. <laughs> and also to this other side. It, it's it, called the the Bolt's spin, sphere, right? Yes. So it can be anywhere like in a sphere instead of being up and down. That, yeah. as we know, is the, one the, and zero. One of the problems, well, I would say, I would say situations with quantum computers is that you don't, re you don't require a lot of physical space to do all, some calculations. Right now, the problem that we have with quantum computers is that we still do not know a lot of how the physics of the universe how work. How are we right. going to make them? Yes, right now there's some, uh, I will say, models like working, like I think Google and IBM, they're working on some of them, and you can play with them, like with IBM at least, right? Uh, but they don't have that many qubits, so it's just a couple of them, right? The thing is that, uh, like, uh, it, right now we are kind of like in the 60s, that we have like the super big computers, right? And now, like 50 years later, we uh, we have like, what, like cell phones, right? Yeah. We don't know, and right now we are like, at this point we have like the super big quantum computers. We don't know if like in this 50, 60 years from now we will have a small device, right? We don't know that, right? The point is that actually like uh, we still have to... Uh, look for a little bit of that right um now this problem it's the like the, the factorization problem the one that i told you like going yeah, yeah. Like to two problems two numbers to one two numbers to it's one easy and yeah, one number two, two other ones hard right the two prime numbers okay so it's that's hard. hard so the thing is that actually like in the industry we have been looking for a different fundamental problem that despite the fact that we have quantum computers available that problem is still hard for those right so it's like we're playing with other complexity classes. We're playing with other stuff, right? So nowadays, like actually right now, there's a contest for, because like in the industry right now, there are standards, right? For, because this, this technology is so new, there are no standards yet. Yeah. So like the idea is that by the end of this year, there's already at least one standard prototype, right? Like say, okay, you should like your algorithm should have these, these characteristics and there are like these three or four candidates you can start using, right? So... Because like the transition in the industry is not easy. I mean, like it would take a couple of time, a couple of years for all the ATMs and all. Like instead of moving, like using traditional cryptography to start using other ones. Because it's like imagine that in five years the the quantum computers become a reality. Like all ATMs, they will be like hackable, right? Yeah, and in and it, sort of seconds. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, my point is that it will take a lot of money. It require a lot of investment in the industry to change and a technology all of a sudden. So that's the reason right now we're trying to look for a, a, a standard and then we will say, okay, so now instead of using this one, we will create new ISO and we will say, okay, now your device has, it has to follow this new standard so it becomes uh, resistant even if quantum computers become reality, right? We don't know if they will become or not, but the thing is that actually uh, 
that's what we are like, planning for, right? The thing is that actually, like, um, well, we are looking for fundamental new problems, yeah. right? That despite the fact that we have quantum computers, they're also hard, right? We already yeah, they are still, they, they remain that you need still years a little bit more of time to solve that in yeah. order to solve them, to hack them. Exactly. Because if you have quantum computers available for hackers, mm -hmm. then you must have a type of a... You know who is going to get the, the quantum computers first? The army. Yeah, for sure. So for basically sure. it's like, imagine China and USA and they have like a, like kind of like information war. And we yes. are worried about uh, people yep. hacking our WhatsApp. So basically it's like... sending the stickers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, right. the thing is that actually like we're looking and we already found some fundamental problems that uh, they seem to be resistant against these, these computers, right? Uh, we don't, that, but right now is everything is a lot of a speculation because it's like we don't have a physical computer yet to start playing with it. We only have the theory how they're going to behave and we can simulate it, right? So we assume, okay, the computer should behave this way, should, yeah. be, should have this performance, should be able to do this, right? So now then we are going to uh, create new standards, assuming that actually those things are true. Then uh, basically, like uh, we're going to create the standards, so the the problems are hard, right? Regardless if they happen or not, right? Um, okay, so basically, like um, I would say that that's the 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 part of the um, yeah, so like like this one, right? Of quantum uh, computers, of, quantum, uh, uh, of, of, of the about. of the post quantum cryptography. This is one of the things that I have been working on, like with DSMC, like to basically create like a, a semiconductor that has like some of post quantum properties. Okay. Right? As and I said, like in the near future, what will happen is that uh, we are we hope that by the end of this year, uh, we have a industry standard or at least like a prototype, like for the standard, right? So. But there's one problem. There's a fundamental problem that I want to share with you also. Okay. Which is that, uh, okay, right now, all this situation happens because P and NP might be different, might be the same. We don't know. Okay. Right? I told you at the beginning, there might be a situation that uh, we require math and we require knowledge that doesn't exist yet in order for us to know if it is true or false, right? And um, that theory might not even exist for a couple of hundred years. Okay. Right? So, and I give you an example, and this is the reason why I hop this, right? Okay, bring it up. Okay. So, <laughs> before going on this, right? Uh, no, before this. Okay, okay, right, okay. So, um, there have been, like, I would say ages in human history that actually, like, uh, humans have made really huge discoveries, right? Yeah. Right now, we are in the computer era with the internet, which is basically equivalent to when people discover fire and basically when we people start using electricity, right? There have been like big, big revolutions. Big revolutions, big exactly. Steps. Yes. So... New technology. Exactly. So in the past, for example, who were the, the most... I would say like in biblical times, who were the, the most... It's like the smartest people. Who were the smartest people around there? It was like the Greeks, Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. The Greeks were really smart people and they were like creating the theory that we still use today, right? And I'm Pythagoras. Pretty sure Pyth Pythagoras, yeah. yes, like Plato. Like, you know some of these people, right? And I, I, I want to show you an example of a problem that uh, they had that uh, they, they didn't know the solution, if it if was solvable or not, right? Yeah. And that's the reason why I wrote this because like we are in the same situation. We are in the new Greeks. Right, and we have some problems that we don't know if the solution are the same or not. Right, okay. like I mean, we, if it can solve it or not. And um, the thing is that, uh, like, I will show you a little bit of this, the story of this. Um, for the Greeks, like, uh, they didn't have computers like us. Like, their tools were like normal. Uh, I would say no, no, <laughs> not chopstick. Uh, like a compass and ruler, right? Uh, they didn't have like the, the the high school compass that the one that you open. Okay. What they used to they used they basically had for example like strings. A shoelace. Yeah, shoelace. Yes, it's a string, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. A string, and they didn't have like a ruler with marks. They have like a stick that actually like they could use goes like just you, it goes straight, right? Yeah. For example, if you're an ancient Greek and I say, look, I will, I have this land and I will sell, I want to sell it to you, right? And I, I want this amount of money, right? But they say like, okay, I want to, instead of you say, you say like, I don't want, I cannot pay you, but I can give you this other land, right? I don't want something smaller or something bigger. We want something equivalent, yeah. right? So what the concept of equivalent, equivalent that they had is like, okay, if they have the same area. For sure. They, I was going to say that. Yeah. Okay. So then 
how can you measure or how can you say if two lands are have the same area or not, right? Or can you, like, and they, they basically they say, okay, if I can, if, let's suppose that actually we, you have a big land, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. so look, we can just draw it, right? We are A and B, right? Yeah. I have this one, right? And I say, okay, I wanna, I wanna sell you this chunk of my land. And you have your, this other land, which is different in size, yeah. right? And I, we, I want you to give me like a, this area, like this kind of your land, right? But we want something equivalent. So how can I construct something from here to here, right? How can we measure that with the tools that they had at that, at that time, which is basically like a like yeah, a, yeah. a ruler with no stick. It's called straight edge. Like it's a like a straight, straight rule, edge. A straight edge. It's like a straight rule without marks and basically like a compass, right? Yeah. So how can you do? How can you construct from here to here with the same area, right? That's one of the fundamental problems the Greek had, right? Another of the fundamental problems that the Greek had was um, how to. I didn't have this. Sure. How can um, for example, let's suppose that actually you're one of your... So this is the problem that they couldn't solve. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm just giving you the, the okay, background. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sure. So imagine that I have like a, I don't know, like a, a land that is not a square, but it's kind of like like this. Like, I don't know, like something... Rhombus. Eh, something weird, right? And I have three kids, right? Three. Well, I, well, let's suppose that I have two kids, right? It's not. It's not perfect. It's just like something, something a little bit more like this, right? And I have okay. two kids, and I want to divide it in equal size, right? Is it like this the best solution, or is it? Is there any other better way to give like like an equivalent solution, yeah, sure. right? The thing is that actually, like the Greeks had two fundamental problems. The, well, they had more of them, but one of like the two ones that I want to bring in today is basically how to transform. Any geometrical figure, like for example a rectangle, a triangle, or a circle, into equivalent size area square, right? Or this one is equivalent to this one, or this this one is also equivalent to this one, like equivalent in area, yeah. just using like a straight edge, like a ruler and also a compass. Okay. Right. There is a thing they were able to solve for rectangles, for triangles, but they were not able. They were not sure for circles, right? So that's one of the fundamental problems they had. Like, if you have a circle, how can you construct with straight edge and a compass an equivalent area square, right? They knew the solution for this one and for this one, but they didn't know how to solve this one, right? That was one of their millennium problems. Because they couldn't measure the perimeter or... No, I mean, like, you have a, you have a, a, like a, yeah, like yeah. a string, right? But the thing is that, how can you do that, right? And then... That's one of the like one one of their millennium problems. Like they have a lot of them, but that was one of the most important ones, right? The thing is that uh, that now they have they had another problem, which was like like a uh, imagine that I have like this one. Can you help me with that? Sure, right? for sure. Okay, so imagine that you have like an angle, right? Like this one. Oh my god. <laughs> yes, and this one, right? How can I find the line that actually divides by half the angle, right? Just using the compass and the straight edge, right? It's fair simple. How you do it is like, I will show you this, right? What you do it is like you have uh, your compass with a random size, like I will say radius, right? You just basically put it like in the center, right? Oh, okay. You draw the arc. You, you draw an, an arc, yes, let me change the color. I think it would be easier to do like this, right? So you draw it like an arc, right? Like here. Then on one of each point, you do it like this, right? Like this one and this one. And right? when they intersect. Intersection, then you with a straight edge, like something like this, right? I mean, like assuming that this is like infinite long, right? You can just divide the angle, right? And that will always work for any angle that you have. Right? Yeah. Now, I don't want you to divide it by half. I want you to divide it by thirds. The thirds, how you do it. That was another of the fundamental problems they weren't able to solve, right? Ooh la la, merci. So the thing is that <laughs> finding a, a way to construct, like from a rectangle, a triangle, a circle, any figure, an equally sized square was problem, for example, problem one, and this one, given an angle to trisect it, like to divide it in three, yeah. by using just a compass and straight edge, that was the second problem, right? The thing is that uh, they didn't know how to do it. They knew how to solve that, for example, to divide it by two, yes. they knew how to solve it for a rectangle, for a triangle, but they didn't know for a circle. They didn't know for a for for divided by two, right? Like for divided by three, right? The angle. 
So the thing is that uh, they, for those, they were kind of like their millennium problems. They didn't know like if the solution was possible or not. Turns out the solution is impossible. Impossible? Right? Yes, it's impossible. For a circle, you cannot construct an equally sized square, a equally area square with uh, like a compass and a straight edge. And you cannot divide the triangle by th like in, in, in three, right? With also the same tools. You cannot do it. The solution, or when we found out that those problems were impossible. Okay, those are the Greeks. Greeks is the time of Jesus, right? Jesus. Okay, these solutions were found out in the what uh, I think is 19th century, yeah. right? Like 1800s. The 1800s. 1800s is the what? Like almost more than, more than more than 1,000 years later, right? Yeah. So the, the, and it yeah, was yeah, yeah. it was a consequence of a theory that it was not even looking for it. Like some other people were look, were studying some stuff and they were like, oh, consequence. Like these two problems are impossible to solve, right? Okay, but then what will happen if the Greeks said, okay, we don't know the solution, but let's assume that it's possible. And they start creating theory. And then 1,000 years later, they said, like, oh, surprise, it was, it was wrong all along. So what would we do with 1,000 years of theory? Do we destroy it? Ooh, la, la. So that's the problem that we have right now. We have this fundamental problems like P versus MP and we have the other millennium problems. Another one of those is is theorized that is really related to it, which is the Riemann hypothesis, right? Riemann hypothesis. Hypo yes. That's also uh, another of the millennium problems. The millennium yes. Problems. Riemann hypothesis is basically important because like if it is true, it can help us to determine the distribution better, like better determine the distribution of primes. Primes are not random. Like and they are not finite. No, no, they're infinite. But the thing is like there's no formula for it. But we wanna Yeah, yeah, there's no formula. Yeah, yeah, we wanna right. we wanna find, simplify it. No, no, no. We wanna find a way how this distributed. Because like it's primes are really important for cryptography, right? Yeah. The thing is that remember hypothesis can help us to to determine a distribution of them, right? P versus MP and this problem, they seem to be related, right? For this problem, the square and circle equivalency and the division of the triangle of the of the angle, they came from the same theorem, the solution of both of them. Right, like the consequences, like they come from the same theory, right? Then these two problems, we don't know if they might be from the same theory or not, right? But we think we theorized. Well, first of all, we don't have enough math and enough computation and knowledge right now to determine the nature of these problems. Yes. And also, uh, we think that in the future, probably in a couple of hundred years, they will come up as consequences of something else. Some people think that, right? And this is basically the last thing I want to cover today, which is basically like incompleteness versus uh, inconsistency, right? Okay. Okay, so right now, the this is basically really simple, right? The Greeks, they had these problems, right? They created their theory and they say, okay, we don't know that. We Let's ignore that, right? But what will happen if they say, no, 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 let's assume that actually there's a solution, but we are not uh, smart enough to find it, right? But there is. And they start creating that, uh, like, a, like a whole math and a whole knowledge and 1000 years later we found out oh it's, it's, it's wrong, wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what what do we do right that's inconsistency right that you assume something true and then you prove that it's false yeah right incomplete means that actually there are some stuff that you can never know if it is true or false right yeah okay so the thing the thing is this our current knowledge is either incomplete or inconsistent In, yeah yeah so there is, for, this is a, these are really important consequences. If it, is like, if it is incomplete, that means that actually there will be always problems that we can never prove or disprove. So, yeah. Yes, there will be always problems that we can never prove or disprove. If it is incomplete. If it is inconsistent, that means that we made a mistake somewhere, right? Who's going to know? And because we will find it. Are, are like, okay, let's suppose that it is true. Yeah. So just you said. The thing is that we don't know, like, okay, so in the future we might find out, oh, this was wrong all along, right? This P versus MP problem, the Rima hypothesis, we hope they are not in the incomplete part. We, we have our logic, yeah. right? And with our logic, we can construct ideas, we can construct concepts and theorems, right? We, but they, like as I told you, like there will be always expressions, there will be always theorems, there will, well, ideas that you cannot prove or disprove, 
let's hope that actually these problems are not there <laughs> because if not, <laughs> we can never prove or disprove them, right? Can no. we use uh, quantum computers in order no. to solve them? No, they fundamentally oh. will be out of our knowledge, right? So like, that's the thing. Like they would either, if it is incomplete, which is like we, what we hope, Yeah. what we can do is like just add them as axioms. We say, okay, let's assume it's true and we can start building more stuff, right? Yes. The problem when you do that is that you don't know if by adding it, you will reach an inconsistency, right? So that's the thing. Like, we hope, well, well, we hope that actually our knowledge is incomplete and we hope that if we need to add them, we will keep in the com incomplete part. The problem is that we don't, we might, we might have, to, well, if we add them, we might switch from incomplete to inconsistent, right? And there's one thing that, uh, they, that might already have happened. Right. That what? That the, that we already might have happened. That actually okay, we okay. change from incomplete to inconsistent because there are some weird things happening already. When you study pure math, you find out that we do something, some stuff wrong. Right. Math in quantum is everything <laughs> weird. Yeah, but the thing <laughs> is that actually, like this, most, most but this problem was really okay. simple to understand. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay, so there are two problems. Is that I can give you easy, right? The first one is say like, for example, like if I give you a set, oh, let, let me change the color, right? Uh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> for example, like this one, one, two, two three, we'll get that two. four, right? If I tell you, give me one of those. Two. Okay, two, right? You select the one of those, right? Yeah. Okay, for example, if I tell you R, the, the real numbers. Here it's two, it's an element of the set. Of the set, yes. Give me an element from R. Three. Oh, the three, okay. How are you sure that this will always exist? This is called an axiom of choice. That you can pick something, right? There is another thing. I saw this with Miss Carla and Alessandro. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that there's an axiom that we believe is true, which is like you can always pick an element from a set. Yeah. Okay. There is another one, which is like, for example, like this one from, from uh, one, two, three, four. Okay. Which is the smallest one? One. One. Okay. One is the is smaller one. Right. Mean of this one is okay. Mean of this one is one, right? Yeah. Okay. The thing is that uh, there is another. There's a theorem that is called the uh, the well ordered theorem that says that every non empty set must have a minimum element. Yeah. That's a problem with that because, like, for example, for open sets like one, two, what is the minimum of this one? Is one. Yeah. But what is the minimum of of this one? Of open of zero one. Inside here. We don't know. Oh open. Yes, open. But the theorem says that it must exist. But it, does it have to be an integer? No, no, no. It has to be a number. It, there's no it couldn't be an integer because it's like real numbers. My point is that they should it must exist because the theorem says that there must be a, there must be a minimum element. Choose right? It. The thing is that this one and this one are really related, yeah. right? So if if this if we can select, then this theorem happens. But if this thing happens, that means that our order, how we are ordering, is not the best way how we order. Like the like like the we are ordering wrong. wrong. Yes. So like they <laughs> might be wrong at this yeah time. because <laughs> there should be another way to order the numbers so we can get the minimum on this one, right? So there is a problem that we might already reach the point that I told you that we change from incomplete to inconsistent, right? This is basically pure logic, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? So um, can I have the cup? Okay. So basically, like um, we don't know yet how we are, but the thing is that right now, as I told you, we are the new Greeks with the computer, right? And we are studying like this quantum things, right? So we let's hope that actually right now we keep in the incomplete part and not in the consistent, right? Yes. Well, Dr. Pontaza, <laughs> I'm very, very sad, and I think our audience too, that this podcast is going to an end. Yes. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for thank all you. your knowledge, all your time. And I want to publicly say that uh, I'm very happy that you became our guest. <laughs> thank you. Because we've had many other podcasts, but for three hours, four hours, just by talking. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted you to come here and let like everyone know all your knowledge. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Nos vemos la próxima vez. Gracias. We
Out. Yo creo que estaba más fácil, ¿no? Thank you very much for watching this episode. Like the video in case you liked it. And leave a comment below for further improvement of our content. As well, if you like topics such as new technologies, research done in universities, or even wonderful stories of incredible people, subscribe to our channel. This is how you find us in social media. I want to give a special thanks to all my sponsors and team members. Y recuerda, toma pulque y come nopal, que la próxima semana otro video se va a lanzar.